Hey, before we get started, I just want to let you guys know about my comic, Dark Phantom. Issues 1 through 10 are available now for free on Webtoon, with number 11 coming soon. We've worked really hard on it, and it would mean a lot to me if you would check it out. Thanks, and let's get on with the video. Legs. Still got legs. And also a uh, comically oversized jacket. You know, it was the right color, and sometimes you just gotta go with what the thrift store has. But uh, anyway, hi, welcome to Class Act Media. I'm Jack, and we're finally starting the Stephen Moffat era and the era of Matt Smith's 11th Doctor, with all the highs and lows that it has. There's gonna be a lot to talk about. Matt Smith is a very interesting doctor to me. His look is instantly iconic, with his tweed jacket, suspenders, and of course the signature bow tie. What if it was purple? Oh, come on! He was also known for his grand monologues and speeches, but I'd say that's more of a quality of Stephen Moffat as a writer rather than the 11th Doctor himself. As of right now, he's the youngest actor to ever play the Doctor, beating out the former record holder Peter Davison. And while a lot of people say that the fifth Doctor was mostly defined by his youth, I'd say that applies a lot more so to the eleventh Doctor. Smith's Doctor was very silly and eccentric, running around the place getting excited by everything he saw and waving his arms around as though his limbs were controlled by a separate brain than the rest of his body. But when he needed to get serious, he could change on a dime and become the most grounded, stern, level-headed person in the room. You got the sense that this was a man who had lived so long that he had given up all pretense of putting up any sort of facade. If he wanted to have fun, he was gonna have fun, and he wasn't gonna care what anyone else thought of him, but that didn't mean he had lost his edge. At least, that's how he started. As the seasons went on, the 11th Doctor started to get more and more flanderized, until by the end of his run, he was acting less like a fun grandpa and more like an adult with the brain of a child. If I had to pinpoint the exact moment this decline started... Fezzes are cool. There, it was right there. It's really a shame, Matt Smith was giving an excellent performance his entire run, but it's like behind the scenes they just forgot how to write for him at some point. Eleven still had his moments of greatness in the latter half of his era, but most of his best stuff is really front-loaded into that first season. Maybe his character kind of stagnated a bit, since for the first two and a half of his three-season run, he was joined by the same two companions, Amy and Rory. Now, I really like the concept behind Amy. She first met the Doctor as a little kid, but when he got into the TARDIS and told her he'd be back in a few minutes, he accidentally overshot it and showed up twelve years later. This led to her entire life kind of getting completely screwed up, and she spent most of her life obsessing over the Doctor and waiting for him to come back while pretty much everyone around her assumed he was just an imaginary friend. When the Doctor finally did return, Amy abandoned Rory on their wedding night to go traveling with him. When their dynamic was written well, the Eleventh Doctor and Amy were a great pair. They certainly cared deeply about each other, but you also got a sense that their relationship was really codependent and unhealthy. This was only exacerbated when Rory entered the TARDIS, as he felt like, even though he was Amy's husband, he was always playing second fiddle to the real most important man in her life, the Doctor. This led to a group of people who genuinely loved one another, but also had an unhealthy reliance on each other and a largely unspoken resentment. But again, I have to stress that this was only when their dynamic was written well. Far too often they would fall back on the incredibly tired cliché of Rory feeling jealous of the Doctor, like they were romantic rivals or something. And given the revelations that come up later, that just feels really creepy and incestuous. I don't know why they keep returning to that well, there are so many episodes revolving around Rory being jealous of the Doctor only for Amy to reveal that of course she loves Rory more, but then in the very next episode we're right back to square one. There were times when it was pretty obvious that the writers didn't know what they wanted to do with Amy and Rory, and that only became more apparent the longer they stuck around. There are multiple episodes where the Doctor realizes how bad he is for Amy, so he leaves both of them behind on Earth. These would all have been good conclusions to Amy and Rory's story, but inevitably the Doctor would come back and they'd repeat the cycle all over again. There's even an episode that starts with Amy and Rory getting a divorce, and then by the end of the episode they're back together and it's never referenced again. I do think at least by the end of their time on the show, Amy and Rory had stabilized and the writers had decided what direction to take them in. They were trying to live a normal domestic life while also occasionally going on adventures with the Doctor, ending in a predictable but still very well done tragedy. I just think they could have left much earlier, they didn't need to stick around for as long as they did. 
A season and a half, maybe. Two seasons tops. For the remaining half a season Matt Smith had left as the Doctor, his companion was Clara Oswald. I'll certainly have more to say about Clara in the next video since she stuck around for a lot longer after this, but I'm really not a big fan of her time with the 11th Doctor. Basically, the premise behind Clara's character was that the Doctor kept meeting different versions of her throughout time and space, only for her to die while saving his life each time. The main reason that the Doctor decided to take the modern day version of her that he met with him was to solve the mystery of who she was. Mystery wrapped in an enigma squeezed into a skirt that's just a little bit too tight. Yuck! Turns out the answer was Clara jumped into the Doctor's timeline to save him at multiple points in his life because a villain from the second Doctor's era called the Great Intelligence decided to wait thousands of years for his grand revenge of killing the Doctor at every point in time of his life. I don't know, it's stupid. Moffat loved making his companions the most important people in the universe and giving them annoying poetic nicknames. Amy was the girl who waited and Clara was the impossible girl. Even though they clearly put a lot of thought into what Clara was there to do, it felt like they couldn't really decide who she was. In some episodes, she was the classic wide-eyed companion archetype, eager to see the universe and bravely walk toward danger despite clearly being scared. But other times, she turned into the kind of person who wasn't phased by anything and laughed in the face of death. This didn't feel like an arc, it just felt like a poorly thought out character who nobody knew how to write for. The Eleventh Doctor also had a few pseudo-companions, people who showed up relatively frequently but never went on regular adventures in the TARDIS. The most prominent of these characters, of course, was River Song, who had been introduced in the Tenth Doctor's era. The Doctor's wife from the future, who he keeps meeting in the wrong order in time. I like River well enough, I think she's fun and Alex Kingston plays her very well, but I really didn't like where they took her story. One, because they reveal that she's the daughter of Amy and Rory, which, like I said earlier, makes their relationship just a little bit incestuous. Just a little bit, not, not a lot, just a, just, a, just a tiny, tiny bit. And two, I just don't believe that the Doctor would fall in love with River and want to marry her. Sure, I'd buy that they'd be friends, but I just don't feel the romantic connection. All their romance really boils down to is River being horny for the Doctor in practically every single line of dialogue. And that's not really a quality unique to River, pretty much every woman in the Moffat era is absurdly horny for the Doctor. Let's see, who else is there? Do the Paternoster gang count? They were a group of weirdos who the Doctor called on to help him save Amy in one episode, and then for the rest of their time on the show they just hung out in Victorian London. Moffat had a habit of only introducing characters in the episode where they became relevant to the seasonal arc, and then insisting that they've been here the whole time and we're supposed to care about them. The Pattern Oster Gang are fine, or whatever. When they're just a bunch of goofballs hanging out and solving mysteries, I like them well enough, but Moffat kept insisting that they were actually incredibly important people and the Doctor's closest allies. Whenever the show tried to tell me I cared about the Pattern Oster Gang, I cared about them less. I guess that's a weird place to end this section. Oh, James Corden! I guess I could talk about James Corden. He was there for two episodes. That's all I care to say about that. Ooh, look. I have Eleven's sonic screwdriver. It, uh, doesn't buzz. I think it's out of batteries, but it, it, it flips. It flips just like it's supposed to. Play the clip of Sylvester McCoy getting traumatized by Eleven's screwdriver. Oh my god! After the Davies era, season-long story arcs became the new norm for Doctor Who. Gone were the days of each season of the show being a series of largely unconnected standalone adventures. Now each episode had to in some way build toward the big season finale at the end. This new series format proved to be... problematic for Stephen Moffat. You see, Moffat works best when writing self-contained episodes. He's probably one of the most creative writers to ever work on Doctor Who. Like, I'd say he's up there with the likes of Terry Nation and Douglas Adams just in terms of pure creativity. A monster that you forget about as soon as you look away from it? Genius. All of time happening simultaneously? Brilliant. These are ideas that would have worked perfectly in a couple of one-and-done episodes, but the problem started when Moffat had to tie them all together into a full seasonal arc. He seemed to believe that the more convoluted a story was, the cleverer it was. But more often than not, it was just confusing. You could usually tell what he was going for, but he was just really bad at sowing the seeds of the arc organically across the season. 
Things would just happen out of nowhere. Characters would suddenly be in entirely new places doing new things with barely an explanation as to why or how. And like I mentioned earlier, characters would occasionally be added to the story only when they became relevant to the seasonal arc and were treated like they had been there the whole time. Trying to remember the entire overarching story of Matt Smith's three season run, because yes, all three seasons have a continuous story, is like trying to recall a fever dream. Moffat also had this weird obsession with the Doctor's name. The latter half of the third season revolved around people trying to learn his real name. At least he had the restraint to not actually reveal what his name was, but I don't know, I think even revealing that the Doctor has a real name lessens the character. I always kind of assumed his name was just the Doctor. I mean, he wouldn't be the only Time Lord whose name is just a title. The Master, the Rani, the Monk, the Valyard, the Eleven, etc. Much like his companions, Moffat also really wanted to make the Doctor the most important person in the universe. There are so many speeches about how the Doctor is like the greatest person to ever live, like how he's part of the mythology of a million different worlds, how the entirety of time and space would fall apart without him, and I just found that really uninteresting. Like, obviously as viewers we see the Doctor as a very important part of this world and have watched him save the universe time and again, but seeing that importance acknowledged in the show itself kind of takes away from some of the joy of the character. Ironically, it kind of makes him feel less amazing when you constantly tell us how amazing he is. I don't know, it obviously doesn't ruin the character of the Doctor for me, but I just found it to be kind of annoying. That's a good way to describe most of this era of the show. Its insistence of how smart and important it and its main character are are just annoying. When the writing was at its best, the Eleventh Doctor could be one of the most fascinating and layered versions of the character we had ever seen. But when it was at its worst, these could be some of the most irritating seasons of Doctor Who. It was a mixed bag of an era, but there's enough really good stuff that I certainly can't write it off entirely. Look, look. I got the fez, haha, <laughs> fezes are cool, are you happy now? Oh my god, he's wearing a fez, oh my god, he's wearing a fez, oh my god, he's wearing a fez, oh my god, he's wearing a fez. So it's time to finish up this video with the top 5 Eleventh Doctor stories, and just to clarify right now, Day of the Doctor will not be on this list just because I already used it in my War Doctor video. If I hadn't, it would probably be on here. With that out of the way, let's get started. Number 5, The God Complex. The TARDIS lands in a mysterious hotel where each room contains the greatest fear of one of its guests. While the Doctor tries to solve the mystery and figure a way out, a monster stalks the halls waiting for them to lose hope and succumb to the terror. The God Complex is such a unique little episode, right down to the way it's shot and edited. You don't normally see stuff like this from Doctor Who. I also really enjoy its exploration of faith and religion, and how it parallels that with the way Amy deifies the Doctor. I think this is probably the best example of the whole Rory being jealous of the Doctor subplot, as they really give a grounded take on Rory's problems with their relationship rather than just going, Oh no, they hugged and that made Rory mad. On top of that, I love how this episode tests the Doctor. We've seen him be wrong before, and people have died because of it, but I can't think of many examples where people have gotten killed specifically by following the advice he gave them. That's a heavy thing to throw at your characters, and the God Complex does not shy away from that at all. If there's one flaw I have with it, I wish we had never seen the monster or learned its motivations. I think the story would have benefited from a little more ambiguity. That aside, this is a fantastic and very underrated little episode. Number 4, The Girl Who Waited. Amy ends up getting separated from Rory and the Doctor in an alien care facility where her time stream is moving much faster than theirs. Even though it doesn't take long for the Doctor to figure out how to get to her, Amy has to wait 36 years to be rescued. This is another story about the Doctor utterly failing to save someone, I'm sensing a pattern here. I think because this era puts so much focus on how the Doctor is so cool and he can do anything just by waving his magic wand, I relish any opportunity to see him taken down a peg. And that's made even better here when the person he's failing is Amy, someone who holds him in a higher regard than anyone else. The old age makeup on Amy is great and her performance is excellent, perfectly showing how all her years alone made her give up hope for everything she once believed in. And as if that wasn't enough of an emotional gut punch, we have the Doctor actively lying to his companions and forcing Rory to make the difficult choice of either saving old Amy or young Amy. 
I love when these darker elements of usually fun and happy-go-lucky doctors show up, and Matt Smith plays it so understated and calmly that this is an absolute highlight of his performance on the show. Number 3, Vincent and the Doctor. I know, I know, get your torches and pitchforks ready, this one isn't number one. The Doctor and Amy travel back in time to meet Vincent Van Gogh, who's being tormented by an invisible monster only he can see. I know this is an absolutely beloved episode, and I'm not trying to be a contrarian by not putting it at the top of this list. I mean, it's in the top five. Clearly, I like it a lot. First of all, Tony Curran is perfectly cast as Van Gogh, probably the best casting of historical figure in all of Doctor Who. Secondly, this episode is absolutely gorgeous. The colors and set design can be downright jaw-dropping at times. Its exploration of the theme of depression is legendary, and it's been discussed so much that there's barely anything I can add to it. It doesn't offer any easy answers, and its conclusion really hammers that point home. I think this is a story perfectly suited to the 11th Doctor. As of all the modern Doctors, I think he's the least capable of handling Vincent's many mood swings. But that doesn't mean he doesn't make a real effort to understand. Throughout the episode, I took such a notice of how the Doctor listened to Vincent. It was such a subtle but very appreciated part of Matt Smith's performance. I could try to poke holes in the episode to justify why it's not at number one, but I don't need to offer any explanation beyond there were two episodes I liked more. It's an excellent episode and regarded as one of the all-time greats for a reason. Number two, Amy's Choice. The Doctor, Amy, and Rory are attacked by the Dream Lord, a mysterious being that keeps swapping them between two realities, one where they're in the TARDIS and one where Amy and Rory have settled down with a child on the way. It's up to them to determine which is the dream and which is reality before they all die. Anyone who knows me knows I love character-centric stories like this that put the main characters in the most personally difficult position possible and see what they do. This is where the Amy-Rory-Doctor dynamic got really cemented, and the best exploration of Amy's relationship with both of the most important men in her life. Their entire arc is basically distilled into this one episode, which, I mean, I don't know what it says about their time on the show as a whole, but here, it's great. Toby Jones is also so good as the Dream Lord. He's clearly having a lot of fun and acting just like a comic book villain, so you know that gives him extra points in my book. I think more than any episode in this entire run, Amy's choice shows what a great team Eleven, Amy, and Rory made when they were at their best. Number 1. The Doctor's Wife The Doctor receives a message summoning him to another universe by an old Time Lord associate known as the Corsair. He's initially thrilled at the prospect of finding another living Time Lord, but quickly realizes that he's being lured into a trap by a creature bent on devouring his TARDIS. This episode was written by the legendary writer Neil Gaiman, and I don't think I appreciated that enough the first time I saw it. In order to fully appreciate The Doctor's Wife, I needed to have a better understanding of Neil Gaiman's work and classic Doctor Who as a whole. And now, coming back to it all these years later with that new context, I think I found one of my new favorite Doctor Who stories ever made. The adventure feels connected to the classic series in a way no other modern series episode does. There's some deep cut references to classic serials, but the tone and characters are written in such a way that it feels like it wouldn't be out of place in the 80s. This episode is basically a twofold of two genius ideas. One, the TARDIS is given human form and is able to speak with the Doctor. That alone is a brilliant concept, and Gaiman squeezes every bit of potential out of it that he possibly can. And two, a horror story about Amy and Rory being trapped inside the TARDIS, which is being controlled by a malevolent force trying to mess with them. I can't believe it took them this long to do a horror story set in the TARDIS, but again, it fully cashes in on the potential. There are just so many great moments of this episode, a particular favorite being the Doctor building a new TARDIS out of discarded parts from old ones. It's just a genius episode with genius concepts and offers a great exploration of the Doctor's relationship with his oldest companion. The 11th Doctor's era was a very mixed bag, but I don't want you coming away from this video thinking I hated it. I know I said this a lot, but when the writing was good, this could be a really fascinating and interesting version of the Doctor to watch. It's just a shame the writing wasn't always good. But the Moffat era isn't over yet, and we'll see if it improves or declines in the next video. See you next time, guys, and... I will not forget one line of this. Not one day. I swear. I will always remember when the Doctor was me. Thank <laughs> you.